We're halfway through the year. That means it's time to talk about our favorite games from this year. Let's go! What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murph, and that's right. We are back for a new top 10 in a new set in a whole the new studio. Set. We're in the sitting set. Guess what the sitting set has? Extra cameras. It does have extra cameras. Boom. 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 You can't even keep up Boom. with how many cameras Boom. we have. <laughs> there's three. There's, there's only, there's only there's three. three. Uh, anyway, yeah, we are here to talk about the top 10 games of the year so far. So far, yeah. It's our mid-year Oscars awards, yes. um, which everyone's, of course, looking forward to, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, yes. Because we always find that... In the second half of the year with Gen Con, SN, so many releases coming, uh, it's easy to forget about stuff that happened in the first half of the year. Yeah. And we always have this thing where we're kind of like, did anything even release yet? And then we like <laughs> yeah. look back and we're like, oh, oh there's yeah. actually quite Tons a of games few released. Yeah. awesome games to talk about. So we want to give them some love, give them their flowers before we head into the second half yeah. of the year properly. Uh, so we have 10 of them for you. And Nick, do we have any other additional ones? I think we have a couple honorable mentions. Um, we and we also have another 10 over on our Patreon. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, that's what you're trying to get. Sir. I'm trying to do a yes, Patreon sir. push right here. Yes, yes we have uh, 10 more games from 2024 that we really, really love. Like I said, there's been a whole bunch of them. Uh, so make sure to check out our Patreon. There'll be a link down in the description below. We really appreciate it. And some bonus content. We also do first uh, impressions of games. We did a first impression of ARCs. Yeah. Uh, so if you're interested in something like that, go check that over on a Patreon right now. We really Indeed. appreciate it. Indeed. Well, let's go ahead and get into our, our actual honorable mentions because yes. there are a couple games that only I've played, but Mike hasn't and this stuff like that. So my honorable mention is going to be Let's Go to Japan because I really, really liked it. I got to play this at BGG Spring with uh, Jamie from Foster the Meeple. And uh, it was really, really good. Mike hasn't had a chance to play it, but I really like it. You're planning out a trip to Japan. It's got great card play, kind of delayed scoring. You score everything at the end of the game. It's just really, really fun. Yeah, it's one that I'm definitely interested to try. Yeah. I really want to. My honorable mention is a game that you haven't played, Star Wars Unlimited. Yeah, um, I really want to play this. Yeah, I really uh, was just curious about it and stuff. And, and as I played it, it was like, oh, it feels very kind of like Star Realms or the Star Wars deck building game. It's breezy. You're kind of playing out characters, attaching items to them. Them, trying to blow each other's base up. Um, I really enjoyed this game. I, yeah. I liked, you know, the speed of it. It's, you know, relatively simple to get into. And I'm like, oh, this is really solid. Yeah, I yeah. want to show you it. And, you know, it'd be cool to get some more cards and stuff, but I can't begin to delve into that territory of collecting. But um, it was really... Really fun. Yeah, yeah. I actually thought it was really well done. The art's cool. And I gave like C3PO Luke's lightsaber, and that's Dope. That's because canon now. That's canon in yeah. my my brain. So uh, that's my honorable mention. All right, Star cool. Wars Unlimited. All right, let's go ahead and get our number ten. Before we get going, just want you to know that my camera is the official subscribers only camera. So if what? you're subscribed, that's why you're seeing this camera. What's right wrong now. with my camera? Oh, your camera's ca these are the exact same camera. No, your camera is like more like like I don't know about these guys. We'll find out. No, I don't want to be with the people who are unsubscribed. So, well, I have the, it says subscribe on the bottom of mine. But mine has this cool horn going on in the background. I mean, that is true, but I I mean I guess we can both be the subscriber camera if we want, but either way, just subscribe so that when it cuts to me, you know that's why you're seeing me, right? What's number 10, Mike? Number 10 is a GMT coin game. Ooh. I've been delving into war game recently. This is a jest of Robin Hood. Yes, indeed. This is a two-player uh, coin game, yep. um, which like Root is like loosely based on coin. There's like Cuba Libre. Yep. There's a whole bunch of different coin games. Uh, but this is a two-player only game. Um, and coin games tend to be very asymmetric, where you one side is uh, playing as Robin Hood, who's doing Robin Hoody things. And the other side is playing the Sheriff of Nottingham, who's doing Sheriff of Nottingham things. You know it. Uh, so you're playing two different sides, and it plays about an hour and a half. So we've been really interested in this because, one, it's a two-player coin game, which is already just interesting. Um, and you've been getting more and more into these kinds of games. And then we just both like the theme. We like the look. It's kind of got that old-timey look, but it makes sense for this game. It's not just like it, there's no art because they just couldn't be bothered to make it art. It absolutely fits like its yeah, era and stuff that you're it playing. It actually looks in. really nice. Yeah. And, yeah, you're playing as uh, the sheriff and um, – and as Robin Hood, it's number 10 because I didn't like it nearly as much as Mike did. I did enjoy it, but yeah. you really liked it. I really liked it. I've been uh, getting into, you know, coin games. I played Cuba Libre a few times already this year, really enjoying that. So I wanted to try another one. I was intrigued by the fact this is a two-player game. I think that makes it easier to get tabled. Mm -hmm. um, and I've really yeah. been enjoying it. I like the asymmetry of it against a story we all know. Yeah. Uh, Robin Hood is Merry Men. You're going around and sneaking around the forest and stuff and robbing travelers and carriages. Sheriff of Nottingham, you're just trying to steal people's money and maintain yeah. order. So the yeah. whole thing comes down to this track yeah. of order versus justice. Yeah, it's like a tug of war track. It's a tug yeah. of war. To win the game, you want, if I'm the sheriff, you want to be, you know, you want to have an iron grip order. over the, the parishes and the land and keep them submissive and stuff like that. Uh, and there's these royal inspections that come up 
uh, you like know, every, every third, third of the, the game. game. Yeah. And if you are far enough on your end of the track, so either order or justice, depending on who you're playing as, you can instantly win the game. <laughs> just right there, or it can go to the end game, then basically if you're on the order side, the sheriff wins, or the justice side, Robin Hood wins. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy the 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 way you go of, of choosing actions. If I choose an action, you can't choose the same action. That's yeah. a very kind of coin game, yeah. uh, the action selection it's system is there. It's also event card based, which is also a very yeah. coin gamey thing as far as I know, where like, there's gonna be an event card every single every single round, a different event card, and there's essentially, at least in Jess of Robin Hood, there's gonna be one that's generally good for Robin Hood, one that's generally good for the um, for the sheriff, and so one of the actions you can take is essentially doing one of the options on the event card, yep. but there's only one of those actions, so if I choose to do it before you can, you then don't, don't get, get it, that and sometimes you're like, mm, that's a really good event card for me, yeah. and then you might just take it because you don't want me to do that, Absolutely. because it'll be really, really bad. So it's really, really interesting in that way. And this is a game where, again, I didn't love it because I don't think any coin game is going to be like my kind of game. Well, because it's it's just, it's They're head very head. aggressive. You're trying to yeah. mess up what uh, your opponent's plan. Yeah. So and it's, that's just it's, generally you know, not as much. And this one particularly because it's it's really head-to-head because -head it's two-player. I did enjoy it, though, and I want to play it more because I'm curious in it. I really want to play it async because I have sure. a weird hunch that I'm going to like it more async. But now listen, yeah. Jess Robin Hood is really, really cool. The coin system is a cool system. Even if it's not necessarily the system for me, I can acknowledge it's a very cool game system. It's always slick and easy. So that's number 10, A Jest of Robin Hood. Number nine is gonna be Aqua Biodiversity in the Oceans. Oh yeah. Uh, this is a game where you want biodiversity in your little your little part of the ocean. Uh, it's a tile laying game where you're gonna be drafting out these tiles. And these tiles are gonna have different colors of coral reefs on them, like purple, green, kind of salmon-y looking. And you're essentially trying to connect groups of these same color corals together. Yep. And uh, because if you can bring them together, you then will attract an animal that's associated with that coral color. And then those animals are gonna be, and you want different animals because you want that biodiversity, and then all these animals are gonna score in different ways. And then you also wanna make big swaths of these coral because basically at the end of the game, you'll have a big piece of coral, which is at least four kind of tiles or whatever, and then it's like however many animals that coral is touching, it'll score a certain amount of those, points. Those animals basically score a second time. Yeah, exactly, which is really, really cool. Yeah, and if you even get like the uh, your small animals which stack on top of those base coral yeah. tiles, if you get um, those arranged near each other, you can even attract large yeah, animals. Yeah, kind of like bigger predators. Which are yeah. sort of a, a race, like if you get the, the, the whale first, it's gonna be more valuable yeah. and stuff. So there's this, all this kind of like layers of stuff where you're literally stacking up. Uh, yeah, literally. Um, things to, to kind of consider. Yeah. There are uh, objectives each game, which uh, there's like a basic set and there's many more tiles, Tons which are like more advanced and crazy, which are like gonna reward you for having, you know, certain animals in certain places or coral, you know, things, adjacency stuff. Um, there's all sorts of ways to, um, you know, change up the game from game to game. And it's like ultimately a very simple game because it's just grab a tile, place that tile, that's your turn. Yeah, easy. But within that, if there's the considerations of, well, I want this blue to add onto this coral that I've already been building over here, but if I put you know, the pink and rotate it this way, I create those three together yeah. so I can put a small animal down. Yeah. So there's a lot of fun decision space and ultimately a very simple turn structure, yeah, which is. I really appreciate. Yeah, it is. It's, it falls in that category of like pretty family weight game, very often yeah. with a the nature theme, um, like Cascadia. A lot of these kinds of games, but there's also a lot of there's a lot of variety because you have yeah. a bunch of those different scoring stuff. Kind of infinite replayability. Yeah, it's got be beautiful Vincent Dutrait art, and so it just falls into that category. There's there's more and more games in this category, and it's one of my favorite. Just pretty accessible family weight games. That yeah. and this one is absolutely a. a bang on for that. It's super, yeah. super fun. I think it's great. I love the way it looks. I just really enjoy it. Yeah, and I really appreciate the direction the op has been going. Yes. Uh, they kind are, of more like the hobby-ish games th rather they than have just a, mass market stuff. A, like this year in particular, a large slate of games yeah. that, are, that are aimed at hobbyists. Yes. People that are already in the hobby, but they have you know a broad appeal and stuff to hopefully bring people in. And so they could still not, be like a Target. 100%. Or a Walmart. Oh, or something of course. Like that, right? They're, they're, so they're, they're like, going like, to live there, but like that's yeah. so important for... Yeah building the hobby you yes. need the aquas which are just eye you know the yeah. beautiful catch the eye um and they're approachable and stuff but there's some actual real good yeah, mechanism yeah. gameplay hobby board game stuff going on in there we yep. really want to try gnome hollow yes which i think is just coming out or coming out maybe gen con really want to try that yeah um yeah, the is just in a really good direction right now yeah. so the aqua is just like oh man people don't sleep on that one no it's um, really fun yeah yeah that's why it's on our list it's number nine Bye. nick Ooh, 
I think we're both about the same joke. What were you about to say? You know what I love, Nick? What is my love? <laughs> I love combo-tastic rolling rights, baby. Combo freaking wombos. <laughs> combo wombos like are combo just... Combo wombos and bumping tracks. There you go. Those uh, are two things we enjoy. I we do, do like... These chairs. That, like, was, that, like that. <laughs> that was pretty, that was pretty <laughs> Luke Kang of you, man. That was pretty dope. Um, uh, I love combo wombo yes. rolling rights. You love combo wombo rolling rights. And draft and write records is maybe like... It's one of them. The definition of like combo tastic <laughs> yeah. rolling rights or flip and fill in this case uh, as you were flipping cards and drafting them uh, with an awesome theme. Yeah. This is a theme where you are a traveling band, you're on tour, you're touring around places and you are uh, drafting cards and the card that you take will be kind of like dictate which area yeah. of your of your, sheet your tour, your band, your whatever. Yeah, yeah. You're adding crew members or a, a musician to your band or you're kind of working on these rows and columns of a couple different areas, which is you, you know, in the press and yeah. uh, your relationship with your fans and stuff like that. Uh, and everything in this game comes down to if I do this thing over here, it completes this row or column, which triggers these bonuses, which go over to this other area, <laughs> yeah. which bumps this track, which triggers this bonus. Now I can cross off a thing yep. with money so I can add a new crew member. <laughs> yep. On and on and on. <laughs> it's just like so you the, uh, there's just turns you'll do that are crazy. They're bonkers, yeah. Because you've set certain things up so that when you drop in this one icon uh, on this one <laughs> area, <laughs> it just cascades <laughs> into 15 different combos. Yeah. Um, it's really fun. I love the theme so much. Yeah, I, we've, we've said for many years, and now I feel like it's finally come to fruition, we like music as a theme. Whether yes. that's like like this, where you're a traveling band, whether or not it's like about making music, yeah. um, it, it could be a lot of different stuff, but like music should be used more, and I feel like it's finally starting to get there, you know? Agreed, yeah. So it's a super fun one if you are into, uh, you know, rolling rights with those combos. And I kind of was like, ah, maybe I'm on my way out with rolling rights. We've just played so many and at this just, point. And at at, there's a point where they were like a new thing, and it was a, met amazing. And now yeah. they're just like, they're not new anymore. So it's really got to stand out to grab you, and this yeah. one does. Draft and Ride Records does. So all credit goes to Paula Deming because That's Paula true. played this game first, knew that we would love it, yeah. made sure to show it to us on Nick's birthday, and you were totally right, Paula. So uh, congrats to you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for showing us. Mm -hmm. This one is really great, and it's on our best of year list yeah. at number eight. So we kind of already talked about Aqua yeah. being kind of like Cascadia-ish. The next thing we're talking about, Harmonies, is also very Cascadia. -ish. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's been compared to Cascadia a lot. Yes, it um, has. Just because it's like you know you're putting down these tokens in this it's one, nature and theme, there's yeah. nature theme and animals and stuff, but they don't play similarly. It's kind of a mix between Cascadia and Azul. Ultimately, is how I how I kind of think because you draft these tie these little tokens out. These tokens are going to be like. Little like cities, mountains, meadows, water, or kind of trees, trees and tree yeah. trunks, basically. But they're on this little depot, and there's three on each one. And on your turn, you're gonna take all three tokens from one depot. That's kind of how it's a zool. Other than that, it's nothing like a zool. Yeah. But you're, so you're taking them out, and then you have to put them into your little habitat, whatever it's supposed you're to be. You're bored, yeah. You're bored. And yeah, and then you're putting out in each of these different kinds of things, like the trees and stuff, they all score individually in their own way. So like meadows, you want essentially pairs of meadows yeah, around. Two or more connected. Water, you want a long river of water that's all connected. Mountains, you they need to be um, next to other mountains because then you have a mountain range. And you can also stack those up high. Yeah, you get more points if they're higher. Trees, same thing. You can put like brown pieces, which are like the trunk of the tree, and then finish off with a green piece, uh, kind of um, earth style in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the taller the tree, usually the better. But then on top of that, on your turn, you can also grab one of these scoring cards. Yeah, so it's kind of like Cascadia in that way where there's all these scoring cards. But the difference is, is that you take a card and then now you are scoring that. And that's essentially going to want some kind of configuration of your pieces on your board. Yeah, it's all spatial adjacency stuff. So it might be uh, you need two mountains that are too high, you know, yeah. two, you know stacked next up too to a high, meadow. next to a meadow in the middle. And if you do that, you can put uh, your cube on the meadow piece, and then you can't do anything else with that piece. Yeah, you can't anymore. put anything on top, you can't do anything else. But anymore. you're removing a cube from your animal card, and the more cubes you remove, the more points you'll score for that animal uh, at the end of the game. And if you remove all the cubes, you get to put it over to your discard pile and, and work on other animals and stuff as well. So it does this great thing that we really, really like in games, yes. where... I and you love being pulled in different, different directions. directions. Yeah. So again, all of the the little token types have their own way of scoring, their own native way of scoring. Oftentimes, these animal cards are going to want you to build stuff in a way that's going to kind of get in the way of their native scoring. So I might want to have a mountain over here and over here, 
It's like, well, my mountains want to be touching for their sake, but I want to get these cubes done. And so now I'm like, well, if I, is this worth more to do this? Maybe I can add a mountain in later, connect it after I've worked on that card or whatever. And so it gives you all these kind of like moments of like, what do I yeah. do here while keeping it very kind of easy yeah. and breezy to play? Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the fact just that the animal cards smooth. are almost always antithetical Yes. to the normal scoring yes. is such a juicy decision where you're just like, I want these mountain ranges, but yeah. this card specifically wants me to have my mountain ranges broken up. And yeah. it's like, but you want to have good. it all. You want to yeah, have it all. You, have it's all. Like, you literally can't. It's not going to be easy. The game is kind of designed in the way where it's not going to let you. And it's just so good. Yeah. Um, it's so pretty. It's got this really beautiful art. And it's kind of like again, rainbow kaleidoscope. Yeah, it's, it's like really not realistic in any way, but yeah. it's just like really gorgeous. Again, it falls into that Cascadia, Aqua, whatever, that kind of very beautiful family Light, weight kind of quick. game. Great decision space. It's just, it's an, I really, really like Harmonies. I think it's outstanding, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, only seven because we haven't played it more and there's also, a, it's a really there's, strong it's, Again, it's been a good so year, so. Yeah, so that is uh, number seven, Harmonies. Number six, I think, potentially might go higher if we get a chance to play it a little bit more. This is gonna be Sankori, the Pride of Mansa Musa. Yes. This is kind of a pseudo sequel in terms of just look uh, to Merv, the Heart of the Silk Rove yep. by Osprey Games, but it's much bigger and much heavier. Yeah, it's a big chunky game where you are, uh, you're in Timbuktu working in a university yep. and you are in the pursuit of knowledge yes. and teaching students. Yeah. Uh, in the four areas was astronomy, uh, theology, law, and mathematics. mathematics yeah, exactly. Um, and, there, and those kind of correspond to the four areas of the game. And you are taking actions, and and every time you kind of take an action in a certain area, you're thematically building your knowledge in that area. Yes. So you start to be able to take stronger and stronger yes. actions in that area the more you kind of invest. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of bonuses and things to to take from each of the four areas mm -hmm. if you invest in those areas heavily. Um, the things I, I really like about this game, A, you know, tool, yeah, and just like Merv. Merv, and, and this is saying a lot because you know, tool is such a good artist. Merv and Sankore might be his best work, and that's saying so they're much. So insanely beautiful, <laughs> they're and so, colorful. They're and, just pieces of art. I mean, they yeah, really are. Yeah, it's so it's, so that is very appealing and yeah. stuff. But uh, there's all sorts of fun things you can do in these kind of main actions and these supplementary actions. Yeah, and it's kind of got a bit of that Paladins of the West Kingdom ishness to it. And what I mean by that is like in Paladins of the West Kingdom. You have like three things. You have like faith, military, and like trade or whatever they are. Um, and basically, uh, or influence if it is not trade. But basically, like if you're doing this action, it's gonna, you need to have high influence and it's gonna give you faith. Yeah. But so you're kind of like, it's, you need this thing, but this action is gonna give you something else. Sankori has a similar thing where it's like this action is going to require you to have like theology, but it's going to be giving you this thing over here. Yeah. So a lot of times you're kind of like picking, and this is also true of Merv, you're kind of picking two of the areas and you're tending to go relatively hard into those things. Yes. And then a next game you might pick two other things and kind of do that, but you kind of have to pick a path. Yeah, because again, like uh, a lot of things are going to require you to pay certain resources that are going to output certain other yes. types of resources. And it so you can kind of create... It's going to give you books. Well, books you don't use there. You use books over here. And yeah. so it's very, very cool. Yeah. And what's really uh, kind of really fascinating about this game is the scoring because you are mm -hmm. working in these different areas and you're getting these, um, these kind of scoring tokens but the scoring tokens are not inherently valuable no. to start the game. There's all these books you're collecting and as you're spending books, you're putting them into a library. Yeah. As you contributing knowledge to this, this yeah. you know, the birth of this library. Uh, and there are rows, uh, you know, shelves in this library. And at the end of the game, you look at these rows and see which, you know, discipline is the majority. Yeah. And that's going to add now one point to the value of the mathematics tokens. Yes. And so if you have a bunch of those tokens in mathematics, now they're all you worth chucking one books point. in the library. Yeah. Yeah, you really want to hit it. So you have the ability to mitigate and control the value of stuff. Yeah. Or if I see Nick's doing a lot of law things, I'm like, well, I'm not contributing any law books over there. I don't want that to be valuable. I haven't done anything yeah. in law. Or you can even mooch off someone where Mike's like been pushing law, law, law. So I'm like, I'll, I'll get okay, some tokens. I'll start collecting I'll some, some law tokens, tokens because like I now can benefit from that too. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. It's a yeah. great point of kind of that indirect interaction that we tend to really like in games where you're kind of like, you're not actively being like, screw you, I'm taking your stuff. But you're like, no, I'm going to try to I want to benefit off what you've done. Yeah, or I'm going to try and take <laughs> this majority away from you and stuff like that. Yeah. It's just, 
it's really, really good. And I think this game will climb as we play it more because yeah. it's great. And the game is built in that way where there's these students you can recruit and yeah. they kind of go on your player board and work their way up as they're taking your classes. And every time you recruit students in whatever discipline that's from, the shared knowledge of that area increases. So everybody yeah. benefits, which I think is reinforcing the theme really beautifully. Yes. It's like, hey, we all benefit if we're more educated. Yes. This is a good thing. Um, and so I think that's really cool. And mechanically, it's juicy because I'm like, well, I'm going to take a math action next because yeah. now it's better for me. You know? for and, me like, yeah. and that's kind of really fun. And it's a positive player interaction. Um, th it's a lot to say about this game. It's big, chunky, yeah. beautiful, uh, and there's a lot more to explore. So yeah. uh, big sh shouts out to John Gets Games, by the way, for the, the doing a video seat. about this, which just kind of came across yeah. my feed. And I had not heard about this game. And I was just like, oh, dang, that's my maybe my most anticipated game of the year so far. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and watching your rules video made it much easier to play. Yeah. So thank you. There we go. <laughs> Shout out to all these games. So that's saying, Corey. Uh, let's get the next one. Dang it. What? What happened? You okay? Yeah. Cracked the neck of my violin again. The one you got from Grandma? Yeah, that one. So I got to freaking get it fixed now. Oh, man, I'm sorry. That sucks, dude. You know his name, uh, Luther? Who? Luther. You know the guy like, fixes the violins, you know? Like, it's his specialty? No. Oh, are you are you thinking of a luthier or a luthier? A what? A luthier? Listen, all right, I don't care. You know, you've been to Canada once and you're all French now. I'm talking about Luther, the, the violin fixing dude. He roughs no, them no, in no, and no, finishes no, them. No, you know. that's that's not a person. That, it's the profession. Luther is not a, a name of a dude. No, no, Luther is a name. Luthier is a profession. They fix instruments. I'm, I'm talking about like okay, like Idris Elba is in a in a show called Luther, right? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. No, that show is about. He's a cop in that, that show. That dude fixes cellos in that show. No, he doesn't. What are you I talking don't understand about? The accent, His name man. is Luther. Not everyone named Luther is a. Lu oh, oh, my gosh. oh, oh, no. You're talking you about. Need to find, oh, I you need the, to find a Luthier. Am I not? Am I not pronouncing Luther correct? Are you talking about? Oh, it's, it's actually Lex Luthier is the arch villain to Superman. Is that what you're talking oh my about? Gosh, dude, just call Luther. You I sound, guess you sound you sound uncultured right now. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, that looks like it's gonna work out fine. They totally understand each other. Man, if only there was a board game that explained Luthiers. <gasps> Wait, there's one right here by Paverson Game. Luthier, the art of the instrument is a worker placement game where you're placing out your discs and placing out different strength of discs. And these are your family members because you are a family of Luthiers and you are getting fancy patrons and you are trying to make instruments for them, repair instruments for them and perform beautiful music in their favorite styles, which is either Baroque romance or classical. As you build instruments, repair instruments, and perform music, you'll be placing out your tokens into the orchestra, which will have a little bit of area control. Luthier will be out on Kickstarter on July 16th. Follow the link in the description down below to follow Luthier on Kickstarter. And a big, big shout out to Paverson Games for sponsoring this top 10. I don't know what that was. Now number five is the one that Technically, it's not out yet, but Garfield Games always has their games out on time. So this is going to be Inventors of the South Tigris. Yes, yeah, so they've been running uh, uh, their crowdfunding campaigns in the beginning of the year and delivering by the end of the year. Yes, and so they always deliver by the end of the year. Because it is going to be a 2024 yes. game, although it is not available yet. Because a lot of games are like, this is coming out 2024. I'm like, isn't that we'll say? I don't feel like it's going to. This thought. one, we're 99% sure that it will. I'd don't make us look bad, Shem. Um, but nonetheless... Uh, Yes, Inventors of the South Tigris is the the um, finale in the South Tigris series, the third game, um, and it's really really fun. It's yeah. a game where you are it, kind of these this family, this brothers of inventors, and you are just inventing all sorts of weird stuff. But you're all kind of like you have this like shared infrastructure yeah. that's being more common in a, one a lot of Garfield games, but I feel like in a lot of just Euro games in general. Where just because I have the idea for this invention, which is me putting the invention out there, Mike can be the one that builds it, yep. and then someone else can be the one that like innovates upon it, or that's actually, that's the other inventions game, <laughs> but to test it and things yeah. like that. And so it's this kind of shared infrastructure where like you don't have to do the entire invention process yourself. Sure. You can kind of throw it out there, and someone else is like, ooh, I, I, want, I want to get in on that, I'll build it, and then I'll test it, and da 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 And it's just... Uh, God, there's a lot going on in this game. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, in this game, there is... It's a big one. It's a like, big game. It's a big, beefy game. It's the biggest Garfield game by... I'm not going to say a massive margin. A but, margin, though. But a margin, yeah. It's it's a big one. There's many levers to pull, but it all comes down to kind of those four things you mentioned about coming up with an idea for an invention, building it, 
testing it, publishing about it. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of drives your your goal. But you have these this kind of pool of, of uh, artisans, these crafts folk in different areas that are going to help you out with building yep. things. You're going to be leveling them up. There are tiles you can get to put onto your player board, which you can then activate and do different things with. There's dice placement. There's worker placement. Yep. There really is a ton. Uh, and, and you know, you're if going we, up we a river, get, you're getting like special <laughs> powers. There's all There's sorts so of stuff. stuff in this game. But they're all in service of those four main yeah. actions. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there's all these things you can do to build up your resources and do your stuff, but it's all to kind of work on those inventions. And we really do enjoy that shared infrastructure to your point of like, oh, you just came up with this idea and that works well. If I build it, I'm going to get some, you know, some stuff out of this uh, that's going to mm -hmm. be really useful for what I'm trying to do. So yeah. I'm going to build that now and then maybe test it or you test it or whatever. So we really enjoy, you know, I guess opportunities popping up mm -hmm. that you weren't expecting to give you a chance to kind of pivot yeah. and, oh, let me try this thing now. This seems kind of cool. So yeah. um, Inventors of the South Tigris does that really well. And it's got a fun, like, vibe because all the things that you're inventing are, like, they're silly. Like gizmos, I guess, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. They're just random things. And they all have the way that works is you have this kind of this board, which is going to be some sort of like adjective. It yeah. might be flying or whatever. And then you're going to put down this a idea. Bucket. So a flying bucket. It creates these strange, <laughs> yeah. like nonsensical things. Horse-powered eyeglasses. Yeah. yeah. And then like stuff like that's just really fun, yeah. and it, which is, is a, a nice thing in a game that is so heavy yes. to have something that's kind of like Because it's light. all just flavor. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. It's all flavor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it kind of fits the whimsy of like these brothers that did invent like random stuff or came up with ideas of things that like don't make sense necessarily or don't work or aren't like useful for yeah, the world. Yeah. But like that's cool because yeah. the point is the creativity and invention. And um, this game just gives you a lot of ways to go about achieving your goals, which is really cool. It can be feel overwhelming. But here, because you have those four main actions, there's enough guidance yes we talked about this with the whole trilogy wayfarers and south tigris completely wide open yes there's no real direction no sure in, in the, until you create one for yourself yeah. scholars and south tigris is much more linear yeah you're getting scrolls you need to get some uh translators yeah. translate those there's scrolls. Like steps to everything yeah. this one lands in the middle where yeah. it's like you have these four areas but there's a lot of ways to go about doing yeah. those things so it's really kind of a cool spot yeah and you're like oh i need a i need this resource and there's just 150 different ways to get that. But it's kind of <laughs> nice because you're like, you can always get what you need. You just might have to do it in a kind of weird, different Try way. Try as but efficient just, as you can. You know? It's just really, really good. It's a really good uh, uh, finale to this trilogy. I mean, the trilogy is so freaking good. Yeah. I'm so excited for the more stuff. But um, nonetheless, that is Inventors of the South Tigris. It real good. Number four is going to be a video game that turned into a board game. This is Slay the Spire, the board game. To be fair... It was a video game that was pretty much just a board game. Yeah, more game. or less. Yeah. So this is Slay the Spire, the board game based on Slay the Spire, the video game, which is a deck building game, yeah. which is a board game. Yes, exactly. Right? More, yeah, that's actually. A, I a, can't a, make it more clear than that. Yeah, Nick. exactly. Uh, so Slay the Spire takes the video game and and puts it into board game form, yeah. and it also makes it multiplayer. Yes. Uh, cooperative. cooperative. Yeah. Uh, which uh, Slay the Spire is just a, a you know a solo adventure. Yeah, I think like, there's like a mod that makes it like cooperative, but yeah, it's it's a solitaire right. game. Yeah, it's a solitaire game. So this one will make you uh, you know you get to play. Is the four kind of characters from the first Slay the Spire. Yeah. Um, and and they all have their own starting deck of cards, their own deck of uh, reward cards you can get that are tailored to their style. Yeah. Uh, there's like the Ironclad, like gets a bunch of strength and stuff, and the Silent gets a bunch of shivs and poison. So they all have their own style and flavor. But now it makes it a cooperative game where you're going to be going through the three acts as you ascend the Spire. Yep. Like you do in Dealing with, you know, combat and different encounters and things. Uh, but you can work cooperatively and you can work. It really is cooperative. There's Truly. a lot of cards, especially once you upgrade them, where you can like give block to other people. You're like, yes. hey, I'm going to hit this person and give them vulnerable so that when you hit them with your big hit, it's going to do double damage. Yeah, now. there's not like a turn structure. So no. it's not like I do all my stuff, then Nick does all yeah. his stuff. I can play a card, then Nick plays a card, then I play the rest of my cards, yeah. and then Nick go, or whatever. Uh, and you're doing this because as you go into a combat, we're each going to be in a different row on our play on the board, the central yeah. board, and we're each going to have our own monsters to fight. Yeah. And you can attack anything that's out there. Yes. I can attack stuff in your row and you can attack stuff in mine. But the things in my row are going to attack me yes. and the things in your row are going to attack you. So if you're going to get hit real hard, yeah. that's maybe when I would be like, take some block. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or let's focus okay. on this row because... You know, Mary's about to get destroyed. So let's you knock know? them yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah, let's knock out their, their stuff first. So I really enjoy the kind of interplay of the cards because that's something that you just, 
don't get in the video game. Yeah. Because you're never playing two characters at the same time. Yeah. And so being able to like lob up a certain card of mine for you to then benefit from is really cool and really different. Yeah. And then everything about the cards are the same in terms of like the names, what they do. So if you know Slay the Spire, you're going to be well on your way yeah. to understanding how this game is going to work because you're familiar with the types of the cards yeah. and the styles of the characters. So I think it does a really good job of being very Slay the Spire. Yeah. And doing some stuff different. Yeah, and that making makes it, it work for a board game. Yes. Because there's just a lot of Slay the Spire in the video game that just would not work. It's too much bookkeeping. There's a lot of stuff. And it's like this. They simplify some things, change some things. And also, as a big... I don't think you need to like Slay the Spire to play this board game. But it is fun when you know the game is... We've both played Slay the yeah. Spire for like hundreds of hours. So it's like it's fun to be like, oh, that's how they did this card. Yeah. That's how they adapted this. Because this would not have worked in, in this. It's just really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, we still have only played... We've played... a couple times we played like, act one so many times man we played act one we haven't gone we past act one acts. i know we never have a chance to but yeah, um, i bunch, really though. really enjoy it i really want to like have a a full day where we can go through the whole thing and try maybe as a live stream uh, oh that would actually be really fun oh maybe we should do a big live stream for maybe, it maybe maybe comment maybe comment bring the stream if bring you want to see us do that stream <laughs> exactly uh but nonetheless uh that is slay the spire number four it's really really fun i got worms <laughs> that's what well, excuse me that's what we call it. Uh, worm span is number three. Put in the comments if you know that's from. Uh, yeah, it's from Citizen Kane. Yeah, exactly. Um, Newspapers worms, and worms. Worm span, <laughs> worm span is number three. This Citizen is a follow up. Is fine. It's, I'll say it. Yeah, it's an old movie, you know. It's fine. It feels like an old movie. Uh, uh, worm span is a wingspan game, which is now uh, set around dragons. Yeah, so it's a whole to, universe now. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to entice dragons to these different caves and stuff to do a bunch of things, but it uses. A lot of the mechanisms and uh, kind of card styles that you would expect from yes. Wingspan. Uh, it's like uh, 75% Wingspan. Yeah, 75% yeah. Wingspan with some some changes that we really like. So the short story is we all the things that are kind of changed from Wingspan are things we enjoy better yes. in this version. It's just because it feels like a 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, we really, really like it. So you can basically do different types of actions by spending your coins um, and you can uh, excavate caves, which will give you a, a one-time bonus, which are always really useful. Yes. You might lay some eggs or you might get some cards or, or some resources. And that's going to now open up another cave spot for you to then entice a dragon by paying them the, the kind of resources they like, the yeah. things like to eat and stuff like that. Add them on, and then you can do this kind of exploration of these caves yeah. and go and like see these dragons. And a lot of them will have stuff similar to like the brown banner cards yeah. from Wingspan, where when you come across them, you will trigger their effect yeah. uh, as you go. And there's also these kind of pre-printed bonuses you get as well when you do that mm -hmm. action, uh, which is really cool. And, and the main thing that we, I don't think have necessarily like learned how to articulate well. No, not but really. It feels like you're more in the driver's seat. Yeah, exactly. With Wormspan versus Wingspan. I just feel more in control of what I'm doing. Yeah. I have more ability to shape the the game uh to what i want um it, and i don't know yeah. i don't know necessarily what that even means but I, I really enjoy just the feeling of when i'm playing this game yeah again i did i just i feel because both of us like wingspan a lot for sure and it's Played just it like a ton, i know? just yeah i just feel like i'm i have more control over what i'm doing yeah um because one thing about Wingspan and Wormspan 2, there's there's a billion cards. So you can't really like be like, okay, I'm gonna wait for i am wait till I get this card. Okay. Or like, the, Good it's luck. like you just might not. So it's all about pivoting, which is one thing I like about Wingspan. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna start doing this stuff now. But I don't know, because I think the way with the cave cards when you're excavating, they always give you something cool. I just feel like there's ways to get there's ways to get what you want to get done done. There's more ways to do that. Where you're like, okay. One thing, certain things cost eggs, right? Well, you get an egg every round. At the start of yeah. every round, you always get an egg. So you're kind of like, okay, you're always going to have one at the beginning of every round. So like, that's not a ton, but you're like, okay, cool. I just feel like when you're running your little adventurer through the rows, activating all the rows, because they have those set places that they're going to go that you can activate, I don't know. It just feels like you can get what you actually need when you're getting like the resources you're not rolling dice yeah, or rather you're just, not rolling dice and then choosing from that you you're like choose a resource cool <laughs> i need berries cool i roll a bunch of rats great i now i can't get what i need and just feel like you have more control over everything yeah 
And I also just feel like it's kind of a little bit more open because of that, because you have like, oh, I need an egg. Okay, there's like definitive ways for me to do that. Okay, I need these specific resources. Okay, there's definitive ways for me to do that. And then like, you're like, I'm gonna get a cave card. Okay, you know what? I don't really need to excavate this spot because of the fact that like, I'm not planning on putting a dragon there, but on this card, I, I can get a couple of things. I, I want this bonus, boom. There is a dragon guild that's happening. So whenever you get these guilds, um, you activate these guild symbols, you then move around this. This is gonna give you bonuses. And then there's a different guild every game. So uh, two points on this little rondelle you're going around, you will get to put one of your cubes out onto this and get some kind of like really big bonus. Like yeah. there's like lay two eggs and then like play a dragon for free. I mean, just like really big stuff. Yeah, it's definitely high reward. It's just, I don't know. It just, it, I, the two ways I can articulate it is like, I just feel like I have more control and it feels more open. Yeah, And I don't know, but like I really like Wingspan, but Wormspan for me, I think is like completely replaced it. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoy- Maybe Wingspan with all the expansions is sure, more equivalent, yeah, I mean, but like but base game to base game, to me, they're they're just not even that close. I, fully, I, I really like Wingspan, but I fully it's just agree. like- yeah. I agree, yeah. yeah. If I was taking just base game versus just base game, I would choose Wormspan. I'd show it, the art's beautiful and stuff, so mm -hmm. it's got the high production level you'd expect. And dragons are cool. You know? Dragons are cool. Um, it's just, yeah, a lot of fun stuff nice. in this one. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just really, really good. Yeah, so it's number three, Wormspan. This was right here. Where's that from? I don't know. Why is this in here? Anyway, Captain Flip's number two. Uh, this is God, a, Captain Flip's great. Captain Flip's so good, man. Uh, this is Captain a, Flip uh, could have been number one. It's not. It could be. Captain Flip is incredible. <laughs> Captain Flip is a really simple yes. tile lane game where you are uh, filling a pirate ship with crew yeah. for your ship. Um, and they, there's like eight types or something like yeah. that, and they all do a slightly, slightly different stuff. Some might give you some coins, which are your points right away. Some might be end game scoring. Um, and the entire game hinges- On one thing. On one thing. It's when you pull a tile out of a bag, you can see the tile is, and that has a certain crew member on it. And but you can choose backside. to place that, or you can flip it. If you flip the tile, it will have a different crew member on the backside. And the kind of tricky bit is if you flip that tile, you have now committed to the flip. You cannot go back. Nope. So you have to stay with your new crew member. So it all comes down to, do I take what I know I yeah. have or do I see what's on the other side? Yeah. And that is always it's the most delicious be decision. Yeah, it's it's that, the most delicious decision. And and the 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 crew, you know, the the breakup of them. There's a bunch of tiles you'll never like memorize. Like, oh, this is for no. sure has the thing. You'll never know. So it's always gonna be yes. mysterious. It's always gonna be fun. There's different ways, you know, like the cook. When you place them, you get one coin for every crew in that row yeah. that you place, including themselves. So, so you're like, well, there's only two people in this row, nah, so he'd maybe. be worth three coins, which is okay, but it's not great. But I have no idea what's on the other side. So do I flip the crew? You flip the crew, yeah. and you're, you're the cook, and you're just like, I really didn't need that. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, exactly. okay, that's not useful at all. Okay. Yeah, it's really fun. There's other uh, characters, the monkey, which can reflip tiles that have already been placed. There's just like the types of things that the, the tiles do are, are fun and yeah. interesting. But it's simple. Bright, kind of cartoony, silly pirate art. Yeah. Um, it's really fun. And I'm like, I just, one of those things where I'm like, beauty and simplicity. It's yeah. just, do you take the tile or do you flip the tile? Yeah, because that that decision every single time, every single turn of that game, that decision is interesting. Yeah. Sometimes you're like, oh, this is exactly what I needed. Cool, I'm not even thinking about flipping it, bam. But usually you're kind of like, hmm, mm. maybe. You're like trying to, trying to look at what, trying yeah, to look what's under there. there. It's just like, it's interesting every single time. And there's a whole bunch of crew in the back, like since you're never gonna like memorize them. And then on top of that, this is something that they didn't even need to do, but there's like four different player mats. Yep, the four different ships and stuff, which have different breakdowns. Yeah, there's you're like one you're like on columns. a deserted island, and they yeah. all are slightly different. Nothing huge, nothing yeah. crazy, but, but you're like, like, oh cool, we have like four different maps we can play on yeah, too. Yeah, there's a nice bit of variety there. This game is stupidly good. It's so just replayable. You yes. can play it again and again and again. It's quick, it's 15 minutes. It's um, such a good gateway game. Absolutely. Like, because you can teach this to anybody and it's just that, that decision is just like, everyone gets it. Do you take what you know or do you roll them dice? Yeah, there's a great player age that shows you how all the crew works. It's very it's easy to get so into. Good. Very easy to love and that's important with board games. Yes. Easy to love games. But it's only our number two, Nick. We do have one that's higher. <sighs> Nick, this one was just like, it's this, right? It's this, right? We literally played it last night just we on a did. whim. And it was a good reminder of like, dude, this game is elite. This is Shipwrights of the North Sea 
Redux. Yeah, the Redux. The redo that that uh, Garfield Games did um, that we played late last year and is now delivering yeah. and delivered to people. Um, this it's so good. <sighs> it's so fun. It's just man. it's just like tailor made for us. It is. You so know? like this is a game that's very openly. Uh, 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 inspired by It's a Wonderful World, which is a card drafting game. It's like in my top 10 games of all time. Yeah, like and we love that game a lot. And this is the, also a card drafting game where you are getting these different types of cards. There's like five types of cards. Uh, there's townsfolk. Yep. Uh, buildings you can build. Uh, there's, of course, longships, which is your main thing in the game. You're trying to do is yep. build these longships. There's craftspeople that help you build. And Jarls. Those uh, longships and Jarls, which are your leaders, which help you bump up these tracks. And you're going to draft out six of these per round. Yep. And then you're going to choose what to do with these cards. You have and to again, use them. You have to use you can't them. can't ever keep guards or anything like that. Well, yeah, you other than your, your ships, yeah, exactly. you can work on. Um, but you are saving up uh, to build those and otherwise using your cards in that round. And what's really fun is like the buildings give you worker placement spots to go to, which can be really cool. Townsfolk can be attached to those buildings to mitigate what those worker placement spots yeah, do. Or you cooler. can discard a townsfolk yeah. to just do their ability one time. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. These are also help you bump down these tracks, but also all of the cards you get have a, a trash ability where you can discard it to get like a, 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 a resource, a, a wood, sheep, yeah, a sheep you know, gold. Uh, whatever it might be, uh, you, so you can discard it. So you have all these decisions to make of like, what cards am I going to collect? Because I just want the, discard. the iron is going to yeah. give me. Yeah. Because I'm trying to build this ship. Iron's over really here. expensive this turn. Yeah. And so you are you are you know drafting in this weird way where I'm like I'm not actually interested in what this card does other than this one yeah. resource I'm going to get. But that's a super viable thing because if you got these six cards, you're unlikely to be able to build or make no. use of all six of them because stuff is expensive yeah. and how you use those resources is you know you got to make some tough it's decisions paramount to the game yeah that's what you're that's how you build stuff yeah, yeah. so it's just so fun and it's, it's very so much a heads down yes you're you're doing all of your stuff after drafting simultaneously you're not even looking what other people have no. like it's it's a hundred percent multiplayer solitaire admittedly so just so. know that yeah <laughs> like so i mean it's and we like multiplayer solitaire games we really do i got no problem with that. um and and shem who's the designer shem phillips uh was like yeah this is multiplayer solitaire it's heavily inspired by it's a wonderful world and it's just like it's ways. just so good because all the cards are different they're all interesting they do different stuff you can build these like big crazy engines you're bumping up these tracks going up these tracks gives you more bonuses more cool stuff it's just so freaking good but you're trying to build these long ships um you know there's like end of round rest abilities like there are in pretty much every garfield game now in days you're getting a bunch of instant stuff you're like bolstering things it's just so so satisfying you're drafting out cards and then making it work with those cards i mean yeah. it's just i see this game climbing and climbing and climbing for me and we started talking about this we're like ship rest number one right like it's 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 like even if we things, hadn't played it last night yeah i think it still would have been, it been yeah. we played it last night so it's really fresh to our mind of like this is such an enjoyable experience yeah. every single every time. single time yeah and every time i played it i've immediately at the end of that play been like yeah, but well, you played it with again. our friend Crook re recently, and then Crook left. He left. You immediately sold it. Immediately soloed it again. Yeah. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I was like, I'm playing this again. It's so good. <laughs> it's so. And good. it solos great, by the way. So yes. Um, yeah, we really, really it's just, uh, enjoy the things it does. Um, this game is tailor made for us. I mean, it just it really Garfield games really in general. Are in that general, way. yes. There's, <laughs> there's two on this list. Like there could yeah. have been a third. Let's be but honest. It's cool to see Shem Phillips go back and and take one of his first games that you know it's widely considered the worst. The, the worst one, yeah. And saying like, oh, I've grown as a designer. Yeah. I want to do some different stuff. I've been inspired by certain things. Let me see what I can do. And then made like maybe our favorite Garfield, like one of our favorites. It's, it's like it's gonna that's be interesting. pretty awesome to do. So anyway. Those are just 10 games from this year so far that we really enjoy. Yeah. There's, of course, so many more that have come yeah. out. There's, and there's, there's so many more so coming many out. More. Yeah, like... Oh, I'm so excited. I just... Man, I just heard there's a White Castle expansion coming out. My hype is high. I don't know when that's coming out, but I'm excited. But if you want to see us talk about more uh, games from yeah. this year so far that have come out, check do out check out our Patreon. If you got a couple bucks to give, it really helps us out. helps us pay for the studio every single month. Uh, and we really, really appreciate it. So yeah. do check that out. Yeah, big shout out to Papers and Games for sponsoring this uh, top 10. Boom, we appreciate and, uh, you. Yeah, let us know your favorite games of the year so far down in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We already told you to, do it. Indeed, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you all next time, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.
Yo, thanks for watching another top 10 from us, the Brothers Murph. Do check out our Patreon and stuff. And uh, big thanks to our channel sponsors, Restoration Games, Board Game Geek, and Garfield Games, and of course, Paverson Games and Luthier. And our month sponsor is Arcus Games. If you want to get you some Storm Raiders, something like that, check out the description of the video for their website.